Um, uh, we were at the last slide. We almost completed it, and I prefer completing it now. If you could just give me a few minutes, because um, it's almost done. So I was talking about in nominate term. Okay. Okay. I was talking about in nominate term. Now, in nominate term are terms which are not a condition or a warranty. And in case there is a breach, then what is the consequence there? It is serious enough to which is enough to amount to frustration of commercial purpose of the venture. And this is what the court held. And there was Abjohn, uh, Justice Abjohn there. He said that the parties can specify in a contract which terms are conditions and which are stipulations and which are warranty. And he says that seaworthiness cannot be a condition because the slightest thing can lead to a breach. Example, example, failing to hammer in a nail and it cannot have been intended that the contract should be terminated if any of these common trivial things should happen. So he said, for example, there is, you know, driving a nail into the ship, for example, that is, that comes under maintenance. So that would be considered as an in nominate term and it cannot be considered as condition or warranty and it would not really displace the entire contract. Next is Exclusion clauses. Now, this is an interesting clause where sometimes the parties would say that we would not, uh, you know, I would support you in everything except these things. There's an exclusion clause. Such a clause in a contract is actually limits or excludes altogether the liability of one or more parties under a contract. So exclusion clause basically deals with excluding liability or limiting the liability of another person. Excluding liability or limiting the liability of another person. Like, for example, for enforcing the exclusion clause, or for setting it into you know, motion, the question is whether it is a part of the contract. This can be asserted by examining if such a clause finds its place in a signed contract or if such an exclusion has been brought to the attention of the other party. So the question here is whether it is a part of the signed contract, this exclusion clause, where they limit the liability. Okay, there are certain clauses in a contract where they limit the liability and say that, uh, like, for example, like they have a limitation on, you know, liability. Uh, like they say that, okay, I will pay you in case of any defect, say around 10% of the contract and not more than that. Sometimes there are such kind of clauses in a contract. Or in case of a delay, so the penalty would be from 1% to 10% and not more than that. So, or, or you limit the liability, limitation of liability in a contract saying that my liability would be to the extent of the, 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 the price of the contract and not more than that. So sometimes there's exclusion clauses in a contract. But sometimes exclusion clauses will be expressly written in the contract, but sometimes it is implied that is, it has to be understood. Or sometimes exclusion clauses will only apply to intervise the terms and scope. That means it should be, they say, as part of the scope of the contract. Now, this matter can be clear if you go to the case of Oli versus Marlboro Court Limited. Here, this is an Australian case. Now, here, the claimant's for a coat was stolen from the hotel. There was a lady. Uh, there was actually a couple, so the, they they went to a hotel room. They went for a holiday. They went to a hotel room and they checked into the hotel. They completed the, the completed the formalities there at the reception desk. But while they went to the room, the persons, the ladies, fur coat went missing. So now they tried to hold the hotel people for you know the the hotel liable for the loss of the fur coat. The hotel came up with a defense saying that, no, this is not my liability. There is an exclusion clause here where they said that if you go and check inside the room behind the door, there is a notice. There is a notice saying that we are not held liable for any loss of your goods or theft of your goods. So now the, the matter went up before the court. The court said that such a notice was ineffective. Why? Because the contract had already been struck at the time the claimant uh, you know, made the payment at the desk. So the, and the claimant had not seen the notice which was inside the room. The, the, the claimant contracted to take the room while he was at the desk of the hotel room, while he was checking in there and not 
when he entered the room and therefore for this case the court held that the notice behind the door did not form part of the contract now there is yet another interesting case here is Dalman New Ferry Limited versus Robinson. And yet another factor to be considered is the history of dealing. So court will infer the knowledge of the parties based on previous dealings also. In Dalman New Ferry Company versus Robinson, this guy, what he did was he it he normally used to go by ferry and he used a particular private wharf. And there was a particular ferry company who had a private wharf and uh, they had a board at the end, entry and exit point saying that the passengers have to pay one penny while exiting and while entering. This guy, what he did was Robinson, one day he was a little late, so he entered the wharf, he paid the penny, he entered, but he missed the ferry. So now he was disappointed and he was exiting the wharf. While exiting the wharf, there was a the security there who asked him, no, you will have to pay another penny. So Robinson was annoyed and said, why do I have to pay another penny? Because I've already missed the ferry. And then the matter went up to the court. This led to a litigation. The court held that this passenger Robinson was used to or was, uh, you know, it was, normal for him to travel by the ferry using this particular wharf and it is not that he did not know the system there and the notice board which was there at the entry and exit point that when you enter you have to pay a penny and when you have to when you exit you have to pay a penny so therefore he was he had the knowledge robinson had the knowledge that you had to pay a penny during exit and uh, entry and missing a ferry does not you know, really uh, exempt Robinson from paying the amount. So the history of dealings was considered in this matter, saying that he had knowledge of it, of the terms upon which the ferry company was conducting his business, and therefore he was made liable. The next part is, is the contra proferentum rule. What is contra proferentum rule? This is a rule of interpretation which is used by the courts in case of ambiguities. Ambiguities is something which is unclear in a contract. Contract terms which are unclear, which are ambiguous. So they would normally use the you know, contra proferentum rule and it is interpreted strictly and against the party reliance. So this rule applies only when there is an ambiguous term in a contract. The last part is contingent contracts. What is contingent? Contingent, the word contingent means, uh, you know, by chance, something by chance. So contingent contracts are contracts, the execution of which depends upon happening of a particular event. So the simple meaning of contingent is subject to chance as per free dictionary. Now, again, to explain it better, I've used again the Indian Contract Act Section 31, which refers, you know, which has defined contingent contract. And it says that if two or more parties enter into a contract to do or not to do something, if an event which is collateral to the event does or does not happen, then it is a contingent contract. That means contracts which are dependent on the happening or not happening of a particular event. Like, let me give you a very simple example, which is not really a contract, but for example, where a father tells his son, if you pass in your subject with good marks, I will buy you something. So contingent, the happening of an event that is a passing or getting good marks of the son, then the father is going to honor the promise. So this is example, a light example for you. But in contracts, example of contingent contract is insurance contracts indemnity contracts, insurance contract. On the happening of an event, the insurance disburses the claim amount. So contingent contracts are valid contracts. They are distinct from wagering contracts. Wagering contracts, example, like lottery tickets, they are wagering contracts. So they are different from wagering contracts. Contingent contracts are valid contracts. And then they are uh, not enforceable if the event does not occur or happen. So what are the elements there? So depending upon it depends upon the happening or occurrence or non-occurrence of an event. So there is a condition attached. So it is a contingent contract. That is something, it depends on the happening or non-happening of event. It is a contingent contract. Next is it must be a future event. 
the event specified as a condition must be collateral to the contract. It, it must be collateral to it. Next is it is a valid contract and the performance under the contract must be conditional. However, the parties may perform generally uh, the outlined duties. Normally, practically speaking, the parties in a contract will perform the general outlined duties. Okay, while you know, uh, uh, getting they'll get ready for performing the contract, but the entire performance can be uh, really executed only upon happening or not happening of an event, therefore, it is conditional. Next is the contingent contract must be possible event and not an imaginary or an impossible event. In this, uh, for this, there is a case Frost versus Knight, 1840. Here, the defendant promised to marry the plaintiff after the death of a father. Yeah, there was a person who promised to marry a lady after the death of a father. He said that when your father dies, I'll marry you. So while the father was still alive, this guy, he went on and married another woman. He went and he married someone else. And thus it was held that there was no opportunity or chance left that the defendant would now marry the plaintiff. So now the plaintiff decided to sue him because there was a contingent contract here that is upon the death of the father the plaint the you know the defendant had to marry the plaintiff but then he this he somehow married someone he broke the contract and the lady was entitled to so these uh, this is an example for you of contingent contract and this is all for consent consent that is a valid consent that has to be free and genuine consent. The purpose of the contract should be legal and lawful and not unlawful or illegal. And the contents of the contract, as in broadly, it is divided into two. That is with the preamble or the recital and the covenants. And covenants have two important aspects, conditions and warranty. Apart from condition and warranty, you have in nominate terms also. And in nominate terms are terms which are uh, you know, neither condition or warranty, and you also have representations. So this is all for this class. And next class, we will learn about uh, termination of contract. OK, try to come to the class on time. However, I will award you attendance uh, to all of you. Try to come to class on time. OK, see you next class. Bye bye. Thank you. Okay, bye bye. Bye bye. Thank you. Welcome. Bye -bye.